I did go to college on a scholarship for playing saxophone my first year. Do you want to know how much the scholarship was worth? $150. $150 a semester, school cost $250 at community college. How um, many years ago? I don't. <laughs> it's been a while, obviously. And uh, I, I have to admit, in front of all of you and anyone watching around the world, I proposed to my wife sitting in the car. Shame on me. I didn't have a ring. I didn't know I was supposed to have a ring. I was scared that she was going to say no. You know what her response was? Are you serious? I'm thinking I've mustered everything I've got here and I'm putting my life out on the line here and yes, I'm serious, but I found out, yeah, you don't do that sitting in the car. <laughs> Pastor Brett has a proposal story where he, they, he's playing piano in some place and it's, yeah, uh, yeah. someday I'm going to have to make a, a better, maybe for our 50th <laughs> or our 34th. <laughs> Hey, this, this June we will be married 34 years, so even if the proposal doesn't work that great, it's, the marriage is, the marriage is fine. So, thank you guys. That, that's fun and embarrassing all at the same time. Hey, uh, this past Thursday, the Season Saints had an event, and uh, I know that there were a lot of you that went there. Just want to make a disclaimer. I wasn't there. Pastor Weaver wasn't there. He was in meetings up in Minnesota, but... It was supposed to be gospel music with a piano player, and he played a couple of gospel songs, but a lot of classical songs, and just want to say our apologies for that. Pastor Weaver and him had a, had a plan, and I think he struggles from some short-term memory and just kind of went to default. So anyway, uh, if, if that, if that uh, wasn't the plan that you thought it was, it wasn't the plan that we thought it was either. We just want to just make, make you aware of that. It was okay. It was great. That's awesome to hear. I wasn't there, but here's what I know. Regardless of what's happening there, you're sitting around a table with incredible people, and that's always great. So, all right. A um, couple other things that I want to mention. Uh, one, we've asked just for your, your input and perspective on the current schedule that we have. We've got two services going on. So uh, one of the things I, I wanted to say earlier, Pastor Weaver uh, was not here for that presentation with Brett and Julie because he's preaching in the other service this morning and wish that we could all be together for that. But that he's preaching down there, so pray for them. That's always fun to have that and be recorded on live stream because I know he's going to go back and watch this. But if you, if you have input on our schedule, we, would, we, we, just, we knew at some point we would be evaluating that. One of the things that we are considering is our 11 o'clock time slot of flipping services. So what's happening in the sanctuary, potentially going to the chapel, what's happening in the chapel coming here. Since the beginning, that service has been overflowing. In a, in a room that seats 400, we have more than 400 people. We have 450 chairs in there, and, uh, and it's a, a full service. So that's one thing that we're considering. If you've got input on that, that doesn't affect this service at all. But just want to get your, your thoughts on that. Missions offering, if you have not um, participated in that, listen. Just continue listening to the Lord, and you can give that offering anytime. Just mark it Europe. One, one thought that I had just in our worship time this morning. There's a song that we ended with, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Do you love worship? Do you love to, to give your praise to God? That's what we were created for. And we've gathered here for what we call a worship service. Part of our worship is singing. Part of our worship is looking into the word. This is what we're doing. There's just a line there, and I don't want us to ever think that we can't sing a worship song, even though it's somebody else's words on the wall. But this, this line is so powerful that I think that we, we um, have to inform ourselves of the words that we're singing. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I'm just going to admit to you, some of you were not singing like ever before. 
Okay, that's it. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, we're going to get there in just a moment. Last week we started a series on the Holy Spirit. We're looking at Acts chapters 1 and 2. After Jesus was crucified, he was resurrected from the dead. The Bible tells us that he spent 40 days, 40 days appearing to his disciples, teaching the disciples before he left this earth. Before he did so, he instructed his disciples, his followers, to go to Jerusalem, to wait in Jerusalem, to wait there for the gift, the promise of the Father. That's what they did. And the Bible tells us that in the room, in Jerusalem, there were 120 people gathered in a room on the day of Pentecost. We're gonna get there in a moment, but that is what they did. The Holy Spirit, he said, wait for the gift, for the promise of my Father, the Holy Spirit will come, and you will receive power when he comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. They had no idea what to expect. They just knew they were going there, and what they were saying is, Lord, you've got to give us next steps, next directions. Jesus had been with them, and he left. Imagine what that would be like. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do, except he said, go to Jerusalem and wait, and that's what they did. Jesus talked a lot about what was going to be coming. And in Luke chapter 24, we have the last words of Jesus. We often will say the last words, what we find in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. And that's, that's some of his last words, but the very last words that we get before he, before he left are recorded in Luke 24 in Acts chapter one. Luke 24, follow along with me in this. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from on high. That's the end of Luke. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and Acts kind of picks that story up, and it kind of overlaps. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 1. It says, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, the one who was baptizing, who, the one who was a forerunner to Jesus, he talked about this coming baptism with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That was the beginning of John's ministry before Jesus even showed up. So he was forecasting what was going to be coming. He's saying, listen, I baptize you with water. I, my gospel is a gospel of repentance, but one is coming after me and man, so much greater and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's a few statements in scripture that are found in all four gospels, and this is one of them. You will find this verse, this, this thought about, about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit in all four gospels. To paraphrase John's statement, he says, listen, you've been seeing me baptizing people, repentant people in water but I'm just a forerunner to one who is greater than, than me, Jesus, it's Jesus. He will baptize people who have been reborn, who have turned their lives over, who have surrendered their lives. He will baptize them in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said these words, I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of context before we get to Acts chapter two. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, and this is our series talking about the Holy Spirit, we've entitled it Better. He said, John 16, verse seven, in fact, it is best, 
Some versions say better. Some say it's to your advantage. It's to your benefit for you that I go away. It's best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. The advocate being who? The Holy Spirit. If I don't go away, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. In John chapter 14, he said, Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another comforter, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now, and he will be in you. He lives with you now, and he will be in you. Who is he talking about? Himself. And Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He's with you now. He's saying, listen, I can be with you, but it's better that I'm in you. And that's the benefit that we have today, the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 2, we see the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. Pentecost is coming up in two weeks. And so we're talking about this a little bit ahead of time, but just where it's at in the book. But the day of Pentecost happened after Passover. The day of Pentecost happened 50 days after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Pentecost. The disciples have been waiting in Jerusalem just as he had instructed them. And verse 1 of chapter 2 says, on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. What is Pentecost? What is Pentecost? Some of you here sitting here may go, I have no idea. You know, when I was a kid, I was a little kid. We went to an Assembly of God church. Out, I, I, I wouldn't even have known that if my parents hadn't told me. But the pastor of that church, and the Tossins will know, his name, last name was Cost. And I remember people talking about Pastor Cost. And then there was this word Pentecost. I thought, they must be brothers. <laughs> I had no idea. They sound so much alike. What is Pentecost. What has been your experience when you hear the word Pentecost or you hear the word Pentecostal? What is, what is that experience? Some people have an experience of, of Pentecost or Pentecostal churches or Pentecostal people being women who don't cut their hair or wear long skirts or don't wear makeup. They just, they, they're known by what they don't do. Some people think of them as, as holy rollers. And I'm telling you, that was my experience when I was little, but we... We attended other churches that, that weren't Pentecostal. They would talk about the Holy Spirit, but not in the way that the Pentecostal church did. And so when I was in high school, my family moved to Oklahoma. That's in the South. <laughs> How many of you have experienced church in the South? It's a little different than us frozen chosen in the North. It was very, very different, and I'm going to get back to that at the end. But Pentecost, we are a Pentecostal church, New Hope is. We're part of the Assemblies of God. It's a Pentecostal organization. But what does Pentecost mean? Pentecost, the Greek word is Pentecoste. The Hebrew word is Shavuot, but the word means 50. Pentecost means 50. Pentecost was a festival, a celebration, a Jewish celebration that took place 50 days after Passover. Passover is when Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He resurrected from the dead. 50 days later, we have this event, Pentecost, and we call it Pentecost because it happened on the day of Pentecost. It was a day that was already happening, 50 days after Passover. It's also known as the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. It's seven weeks, a, a week of weeks. Is that right? Seven weeks. 49 days plus one is 50. Jews celebrated the giving of the law to Moses from Mount Sinai 50 days after Passover. And so Christians, as Christians, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Christian church on Passover or on, on Pentecost. So, this makes sense? 
All right, you're caught up to, caught up to speed. Let's read Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is wild. It's so good. The reason we're sitting here today is because of what happened on Pentecost. Not just Pentecostal churches, all churches. This is where the church started. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they explained. These people are all from Galilee. Interpretation. These are hillbillies. The Galileans, they were the, I'm sorry to throw a couple states under the, bus, but Arkansas, Mississippi, they're, they're hillbilly type people. This is the Galileans, and they're going, how can this be? These are hillbillies, yet we hear them speaking our own native languages. These people are uneducated. They're unlearned. How is it that we hear them speaking fluently in our own native language? Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, they're just drunk, that's all. That's where we're gonna end today. I wanna take a minute to just compare and contrast another event that happened in the Bible. This is the day of Pentecost, where languages were given to people, and they were together in one place. Language was given to them, and they went out and it drew a crowd and everybody came and they were amazed. Back in Genesis chapter 11, we read about the Tower of Babel. You've heard about that, the Tower of Babel. When you read in Genesis chapter 11, it mentions several things that we read right here in Acts chapter two. The people were in one place. They spoke one language. And God came down in that event at the Tower of Babel and confused their language and scattered them. On Pentecost, they were all together in one place. And the Holy Spirit came down and he empowered them and gave them languages that others could extend, understand. And this experience brought them together in unity through the Holy Spirit. Let me read for you Genesis chapter 11. Verses one through eight, at one time all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain on the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. They said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower that the people were building. Look, he said. And this is his observation. These people are united. They all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. What were they doing? They were saying, look, man, we're strong. We're able to do anything. Let's build a tower that reaches to heaven. We'll be famous. We're gonna make a name for ourselves. We are so good. And God's looking at this and going, this really isn't that good. He said, listen, if, if, if after this, nothing that they set out to do will be impossible for them. Verse seven. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. Look, these people, 
are united and they all speak the same language. We got Pentecost, where there was unity and they were together in one place. Some of your versions say they were in one place in one accord. They were together. But at Babel, they were out to make a name for themselves. And they said, this is going to make us famous. It's going to keep us from being scattered. But it's the very thing that caused them to be scattered. God's looking at this saying, you know what? They're in unity. They have one language. They could actually do what they're trying to do, and nothing will be impossible for them. Acts chapter 2, they get language that others can understand, and it brings them even into more unity. And I believe what God is saying in Acts chapter 2 is if I can get my people together in unity with language not being a barrier, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. He's saying, listen, I've got something that can bring you together and accomplish my purpose. Now that Jesus has come and died for their sins and been resurrected and overcome death, hell, and the grave, all of a sudden this is something that can bring them together and we can take this message and redeem the world. That was his plan. This is good stuff. Why is it when we talk about the Holy Spirit? Because when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's a whole lot of ideas. And especially when we talk about the day of Pentecost and when we talk about other languages and people speaking in tongues. There's a, there's a little bit of charge to that, if we're honest. Depending on what your background is, what your history is, there's some churches that don't ever talk about the Holy Spirit. He's there, he's part of the Trinity, but they don't really do much with the Holy Spirit. Why is it that Satan fights against the Holy Spirit, tries to bring confusion about him and about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and other languages? Why is that? Because I think in the early church when this happened, what we see is that they turned the world upside down. Why wouldn't he try to bring confusion to this? Come, let's go down and confuse the people. This is at the Tower of Babel with different languages. So they won't be able to understand each other. And they were scattered all over the world. On the day of Pentecost, they came together. They met together. They were in one place. And when the people around them heard the noise, they came running together. They came together. They were confused to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Chapter five says, at that time, or verse five in chapter two says, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. That is a detail that is not to be overlooked. People from every nation had come together in Jerusalem. What we have with Pentecost is the reversal of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, they were scattered by language. At Pentecost, they were brought together with language. So, we've talked about what is, what is Pentecost, what happened at Pentecost, and the last question that I want to just look at is this. Can I experience Pentecost? Can we experience Pentecost. We talk about the Holy Spirit, and here's what we found last week, and what we know is that when we invite Christ to come into our life, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and makes his home in us. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, he said, you're not controlled by your sinful nature, you're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them don't belong to him at all. So when we have Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he said in reference to the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. We understand Jesus was talking about a future event. The Holy Spirit will be like rivers of living water that will flow up and flow out of them. And this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. He wants us to have the Holy Spirit. Can we experience 
Pentecost? Absolutely. This is, this is another uh, saying of Jesus. He said, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if your son asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He wants us to have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, not just to be in residence, not just living in our home, not just with us, but in us. Does that make sense? Not just that you know that he's there, but that you experience his presence in a greater measure. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. What we see on that day, there's a sound of a rushing wind. There's what appears like tongues of fire that set on them. And these unlearned, uneducated people begin to speak languages that they've never learned. The Bible says very clearly that God gave them the ability to do that. God gave them the ability. Do you think God understands language? Absolutely. He's the one that scattered. They spoke one language and he made a bunch of languages. If he could use the language to scatter the people at Babel, do you think that he can use language to bring people together? God understands language. He understands this. So on this day, the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and preaches a message. And Peter, with the power of the Holy Spirit, preaches an incredible message and I would love for this to be said of me. But in chapter two, verse 37, it says, when the people heard this, when they heard Peter preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? I would love to preach a message in such a way that you would just say, hey, and interrupt the message and say, okay, enough of that. How do we respond? What do we do? Tell me what to do. This is good enough, I need, I need to know what to do. What's the next step? This is what they were doing. Peter, uh, what do we do? Tell us what to do. We're, we're bought in, we understand, we know. Yes, this makes sense, we're in. What's the next step? What did Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise, this promise, who is it for? This promise is for you. This promise is for you and for your children, for your children's children, and to all who are far off. He's saying there's something different between repentance and being baptized, and then there's the gift of the Holy Spirit. We read in the Bible there are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, and we're to respond. He wants to do that. I want to just read for you a couple of things, and then uh, we're going to close. I didn't realize I've been preaching for so long. Does this seem short or long to you? Short? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> if you read in, in Acts, it says that after they responded that Peter preached for a very long time. How many are you in for that? Let the record show about 10% of the people. <laughs> Let me just give you a couple of instances in the book of Acts. Acts chapter eight. Philip had gone out on a missionary journey and it's in verse 12 it says, now the people believed Philip's message of the good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And as a result, many men and women were baptized. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. And as soon as Peter and John arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. They had already been saved, they had already been baptized, but now they're, now they're praying for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Why are they asking and praying for them to receive the Holy Spirit? Doesn't the Holy Spirit come in when we receive Christ? But there's something, there's something else here. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19. 
In the chronological timeline, this is Paul's third missionary journey, about 20 or 25 years after Pentecost. Verse 1, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Did what baptism did you experience, he asked, and they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. They had heard John's message and they believed in Jesus. They didn't even know the, the, the events that happened of Jesus dying, being crucified, and being raised to life, and they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. John told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Verse five, as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The King James Version says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? There's a lot of uh, crazy things that are attached to Pentecost. There's a lot of wild stories. I experienced some of that myself. I told you that my family moved to Oklahoma when I was a teenager. And having not gone to a church where Holy Spirit baptism and the gifts of the Spirit uh, hadn't been demonstrated or experienced, I went to this little church in Oklahoma and I would say, when you hear the word Pentecostal, they were very Pentecostal. Holy rollers. That was them. They shouted a lot. They did Jericho marches around the church. One of my friend's mom, he, in high heels, she would just get so excited and she would stomp on the devil! <laughs> my eyes were like this the whole time. I sat in the back and I'm going, what in the world is going on here? After a few months, after a few months, I realized that there was something to this experience. And while it seemed a little wild and out there, I didn't want to miss. And I found myself praying a prayer, Lord, if this is you, I, I want all that you have for me. I don't want to do something weird. These people are weird. <laughs> I don't want to do something weird. But if, if having you and being weird is what I need, then I want whatever you have. It took me a little while. And I remember coming to a church, on, to a church service on a Sunday night. And I just had this, I had been putting God, I had been stiff arming the Lord for a while. And I had just been, I, I remember sitting there thinking, God, I don't want to miss you. And I remember praying that night, Lord, if there's an altar call, and the pastor asks if anyone wants to receive the Holy Spirit, then I'll go. I was so relieved when he started preaching about something other than the Holy Spirit. I've got to be honest with you. Like, whew, dodged a bullet there. Okay, maybe next Sunday. But I kid you not, his message had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. And at the end he said, everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. First words out of his mouth. Tonight, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit... You know what I did? I set up from my, from my chair and I just, from my pew and I walked to the front and I thought, Lord, this is it. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I, don't, I want you. I don't wanna miss you. How many of you want all that God has for you? I'm not saying weird stuff. I'm not saying, you know, this is about speaking in another language. Part of it, but honestly, the disciples in the upper room had no clue what was going to happen. They were just there, waiting. God, we, we, we need the gift. We need your promise. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. We want the power. Whatever that looks like, I need power. The world in the day of Jesus' life and resurrection and the Holy Spirit coming. They needed Jesus. They needed the Holy Spirit. And there was an evangelism that happened like none other. How many of you know that today our world is in a bad place and the world needs Jesus? If we're not going to tell them, who will? How many of you feel weak sometimes? 
Be honest. As a, as a follower of Jesus, you feel weak to have those conversations. You just want power. Listen, you're not saying, Lord, I, if I can just speak in, in another language, then I've got it. No. What you need is the Holy Spirit. Those things are evidence of his, of his presence in your life and of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I don't want him just living in me. I want him living through me. And that's what we're asking this morning. So in response to this, the worship team can come. I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm not going to preach for hours. But I want, to re- I want us to respond. And just respond by this saying, Holy Spirit, I want more of you. I feel inadequate. And I need power. The Holy Spirit will give you power to witness for sure. The Holy Spirit will give you power to live a holy life. The Holy Spirit will give you power to stand for truth. The Holy Spirit will give you power to love. Love people that are unlovable. How many of you this morning would just say, I need more, I want more. If you want more, would you just stand right where you are? If you're watching online, just stand right where you are. The Lord knows. This is just a response of saying, God, I, I'm not asking to, to speak in another language. I'm not asking. I, I know that those things can happen and will happen. What I really want is more of you. What I want is more of you in my life. The world needs a revival. And revival comes when God's people in hunger seek after him and respond to him. That's why I think it stuck stuck out to me this morning as we're singing. I'm going to sing with, like I've never sang before, and I think, do we really mean that? Do we really want more of him? Lord, we need more of you. We want more of you. Would you just come and meet us in this place? We have no prescribed idea of what you are going to do today, tomorrow, any other time. We just want you. Would you come in this place? Stir in our hearts. Fill us with your spirit to overflowing. We say yes to your spirit and what you have for us. We need a fresh wind of your spirit in our lives. And I just ask for all of you that are standing that you would just be open. Open to the Holy Spirit. Listening to his voice. Responding with not just standing where you are, are, but physical posture, just with your hands raised, saying, God, here I am. I got my antenna up. I got my arms open wide. I'm a funnel for you to pour into. At the very least, if you just turn your hands up and say, God, I'm I'm here and I want to receive. Can we sing this song together? We need a fresh one. If you want to come to the altar, find a place right here and just stand, do so. If you need prayer for something, if you just come here in the middle, we want to, we want to pray. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is here and he will meet and heal. Let's pray.